earlier in the show, we talked about the CM Punk interview on Ariel Hawani. You wouldn't think it would be something that would be talked about in AEW TV and they didn't really talk about it, but it felt like some of this show was geared just towards addressing that. And it was a puzzling decision and it was a puzzling opening 15 minutes or so of the show. Let's talk about AEW and Dynamite. Well, when we... When we were about to go on the air with this this show, I said it was like Tony divined himself here. And you said, well, what do you mean? And I started to tell you the story, and I thought I had told it to you before, but you didn't remember it, so maybe I hadn't. Yeah. But what they did here was like ICW PAFO-like in that it became the opposition promotion that was reacting to the big company and not only reacted but obviously bothered obviously pissed off obviously offended whatever reacting to the big company more than what their fans necessarily i think needed because here for the people i've said this a million times for the people who like that kind of thing that's the kind of thing those people like for the aew fans that really enjoy the program like the program the tribalistic behavior, we want to kick the WWE's ass, whatever. They knew what Punk had said, and they don't really like it, and they they didn't need reminded of it. But for a lot of people, it kind of probably would have gone by them, because still, remember, people in this audience didn't know why Punk was gone after any of the incidents where he was gone with no explanation, both times. They had to be told they found out in the arena, whatever. So the internet doesn't even reach every single bit of this audience. So instead of maybe having one of their top guys make a veiled reference to anything, and in the course of their story they were telling that it was involving AEW's own programming, or maybe even just having one of the guys talk about what wrestling means to him, one of the baby faces give a rah-rah speech about we're all fans, we all support wrestling, and we, we, but they made it personal. And if you didn't know what he was reacting to, you would have thought that Edge was out of his mind. <laughs> and, if, and if you did know what he was reacting to, you thought, my God, this hit a nerve with them because Edge was trying so hard to give a rah-rah speech that it, it he lost it enough to where it was almost like he was trying to talk himself into it too. And it couldn't have been worse that as soon as he starts trying to cut this live in-ring promo at the top of the program about how great AEW is for wrestling and how it's given everybody a, a, a chance or a career or happiness or whatever, and it's not just a clown show operation the microphone won't work he's getting feedback he can't uh, several times before they got that calmed down but did you notice brian when he initially said there's been a lot of negative bs spewed this week nobody in the crowd reacted nobody then when he said well i'm happy to be here what will they react at that but I don't think they knew or cared because, like I said, those people sitting there, they got their own opinion of the company. It's all the people who aren't sitting there that agree with CM Punk. But even they still did. You know, so he had a good heart with this, Edge did. I don't know whether Tony instigated it, saying, Edge, you're my baby face, you're a great talker, go out there and try to talk people out of listening to what they fucking listen to or whether edge came and said, I'll give a, the rebuttal, the opposing viewpoint, Tony, but it, he was trying to fire the crowd up. And like I said, was trying so hard. It, it came off bad, but to re, rebut that it's a, the, the comments that it's a clown show business that's only meant to you know employ the guys to have fun with their friends and they're not worried about making money he talked about all the dream matches that he could have 
with all this talent on the roster and said he's having more fun than he's ever had in his career. That's kind of an acknowledgement or an agreement, isn't it? That it, you, re, I'm, I'm just saying you rebut the charge of this is all about having fun with your friends and playing wrestling and getting five stars with, well, look at all the dream matches I can have, and I'm having more fun than I've ever had before. How is that a, a, an opposing viewpoint? Yeah, and if Punk says AEW is a joke, Tony's a clown, he's not a boss, and then you come out and say, I can do whatever I want. He's the best boss I've ever had. Yes. <laughs> That's the problem. The people that are like <sighs> mad at Punk or mad at anyone for saying the real stuff, the truth about Tony... Yeah, because they don't want the gravy train to end. And don't worry, it won't. Don't worry, it won't. But come on, this was pathetic. And this was he... pathetic. Even if his heart's in the right place, this was pathetic. He was stammering. The mic went out a couple of times, was giving him feedback. And it came out of nowhere. The fans didn't react. This is going to make people oh, want to watch the show. Did you see when they did react? He said, I'm... I'm proud of and respect everybody that started the company and he mentioned by name the bucks and kenny and cody and cody got a pop and then tony Co cody is the only one that got a pop from that crowd when he mentioned those names and you can tell that he was really offended by these con i don't know what edge's personal relationship is like with punk but it was all he was offended because he, but then he came out and said the same thing. So it's kind of like this guy's trying to fucking knock this company where I'm having all this fun, having matches with my friends. This was a backstage rah rah speech for the other wrestlers. Yes, in front of the fans for no reason. For for no reason otherwise than. They, the powers that be, Tony, the top wrestlers in the company were so taken aback by Punk calmly and pretty rationally and reasonably explaining what's going on over there that the story that was so believable because it wasn't over the top, because it echoed and mirrored things that we had heard already and was delivered in an articulate way. It's true, sorry, but the guys over there need to hear from one of their locker room leaders that, no, it's okay that this company is built on having great matches with our friends and getting paid a lot because we're having fun. <sighs> the fans, did, they didn't need to hear any of that. They should have. They should have let that slide off their back without a lot of comment because there was no rebuttal to make to Punk's statement. He, what's the, what's the saying? Truth is an absolute defense. This was one of the more minor league moments in the history of AEW because in front of the fans, you're defending the company. It's obvious that it's only because CM Punk did an interview with Ariel Hawani. What percentage of the fans watched it? A lot of people checked it out. Don't get me wrong. You can see on YouTube, a lot of people checked it out. But what percentage of the fans overall watched it? They didn't react to it. Because if you... You got to also remember, not every AEW fan hates CM Punk. And they all could look around and see what's going on. Dwindling crowds. Everything is less energy. The booking has never made less sense. For the people that want to say, oh, the, you can't say AEW doesn't have stories. No, they do. Every story sucks. They go nowhere, and the momentum is dropped every single time. And there are still people out there that want to pretend and not call out Tony Khan because they want to keep giving him advice. So they don't want to call him out. But that's what this is. This is one of two things. This is him going out there to defend the company for the fans, which doesn't make any sense, or this is him going out there to give Tony Khan an on-air hug because yes. he needs it. That's what this, is. this is his version of Janelle Grant's Christmas letter to Vince. Well, those are your words, not mine for the <laughs> record. But this was, it, it was funny because of the awkwardness of it. But I thought this was pathetic. They should have never mentioned anything about the punk interview. Move on with your own no. programs. Yes. 
But they had to, they had to, because they can't help themselves. And then Edge gives the big introduction to the new multi-million dollar man, Will Ostrich, so we can get a great match in the ring. And out he comes, and this match was uh, Ostrich versus Powerhouse Hobbs, both members of the Don Fallis family with Don on color. And still there was no explanation or reasoning whatsoever why Don is pitting his men against each other except that iron sharpens iron and we want to have great matches. I'm the heel manager, so I want to give the fans the best matches I can. Yes, against my own men to create ill will in my stable, which they will do here in a minute, but not enough ill will, but some queasy will. But <sighs> I got to say to you, Brian, this is actually legitimately the first time that I've seen a sunshine or a ray of sunshine beat down on our boy Will Ostrich. This was not only the best match that I've seen Powerhouse Hobbs have start to finish, and a lot of people are going, well, of course, he's in there with the great worker of Will. No, this was the best Will Ostrich match I've ever seen because this was the first time that we have ever been able to see Will work with a, a real wrestler instead of another Cirque du Soleil performer where they were trying to outdo themselves with the gymnastics and the flips and the Japanese stylings and the no-sellings and whatever the fuck. It was a wrestling match. And Hobbs is a monster. He's not going to do that flipping, diving bullshit. He's a wrestler. So that meant that when he, and you can tell he's a heel because he looks and works like a heel. So now Ostrich had to be in the position where he was a smaller, more athletic baby face that had to use his quickness against the big overpowering monster. And it had to move more slowly because Hobbs ain't going to be out there fucking running around like goddamn gravity or whoever. So they had a good match. And at one point, Ostrich hit one dive and it worked because he was a baby face trying to fight a bigger heel that he'd got a momentary advantage on. And then Hobbs give old Willie boy a suplex on the steps outside the ring. But he didn't nearly paralyze him like the rest of these marks they've gotten tights. He did it right. He rolled him across the thing and Ostrich sold. And then, you know, throughout the match, Ostrich proved he could sell. And, but then when he fired up and did some of these quick moves, it made sense. There's the bigger guy. So Ostrich does the foot to the chest, does a backflip, sticks it, and lands a jump up in Zagiri. And so quick. That was great. Then they sell. They don't just jump up and run and German suplex each other 15 times. And uh, in some cases, he was no selling, or Hobbs was no selling the chops, but like you should, like you can't hurt me, little man. And when Ostrich slapped him in the face, he said, do that again, I'll kill you. And Hobbs was right there for everything. He was in the right place. And then finally, they're almost there. And I'm thinking, wow, no flips, no furniture. They've done this thing. Hobbs even caught Ostrich on a Cody cutter one time. And Ostrich had to duck around and go and do it again. But then finally, Hobbs goes to shoot Ostrich off and goes for a spine buster. And Ostrich is going to turn it into a DDT. And I, I, gar I wasn't there, but I can see it. They, they talked this match and this finish over. I bet you they even walked through it half speed in the ring. They didn't do this move ahead of time. And I'm not saying you should. Why take fucking bumps in rehearsal, right? However, nobody caught one thing. I think this is what happened. This is my mind reading. When Hobbs shot him off, and went to give him the spine buster. Brian, imagine in your mind's eye when Jake Roberts goes to give somebody a DDT. 
What arm does he put over the opponent's head before he drops him? What arm does he put over the opponent's head? The right arm? No. The left arm. Think about it. Put it in your mind's eye. The left arm. Every time you see somebody give a DDT, what arm is around the guy's head that's taking the DDT? The left arm. It's, it's kind of universal, right? Well, when Hobbs shot him off and picked him up for the spine buster, Ostrich's right arm was over Hobbs' head. And Ostrich was going to spin his legs around and DDT him, and I guarantee you they walked through it, and, and Hobbs said, or Ostrich was calling this match, obviously, said, when you pick me up for the spine buster, I'll hook your head, spin me around, I'll give you the DDT. But when they got in the middle of it, and again, if anybody that was backstage wants to write in anonymously and, and validate me or tell me I'm full of shit, I believe what happened here was that as Hobbs was spinning him and about to go down in a DDT, he subconsciously or just by rote tried to go down on the side of Ostrich that you would normally go down on for the DDT. But it was the other side because he had him by the right arm and they fell in a heap. But they fell with Hobbs over the top of Ostrich because he, he just... he. He tried to go to the normal side without even thinking about it, just what you do, and it didn't work. That's what I think happened. But you saw them crumple in a heap. Or are you speaking to me now? Oh, I, I mean, I thought you were speaking to the audience. I did see yes. them crumple in a heap, and then I saw, of course, what appeared to be Osprey landing on his head. Yeah, well, that was next, because here's the thing. I was, so, I was so focused on that, I forgot about the first one you mentioned. They had this great match that Jim Cornette is trying to praise, and I'm really liking it. I'm thinking, okay, there's fucking light at the end of these guys' tunnel. It was the headlight of the oncoming train. They crumple in the heap on the DDT, then uh, immediately Ostrich goes to the top rope and does a flipping, twisting something off the top rope that is supposed to, I think, land on Hobbs as kind of like a senton type of thing or a swanton. And he landed right across the side of his fucking head. And it quickly whispered something, I guess, to the effect of, are you still alive? And then went over in the corner. And then when Hobbs gets up on his knees... Ostrich runs across the ring and throws that shitty elbow right over the top of his head, whiffed him completely, and that was the finish. So now all of these guys have finishes that are predicated, because Danielson's about to do the same thing, on the guy being on his knees where he can't even take a fucking bump. And this is every time I've seen ostrich do this elbow he goes over the top of the guy's head it misses obviously visually so this this is a guy that does all these impressive athletic things and he's goddamn it's like the buckaroos they do all that shit but their finish is a shitty double knee lift with a guy on his knees who can't take a bump bobby eaton used to hate that if a baby face would shoot him in the corner and then drop kick him like these, some of these guys do. He's like, what the, where am I supposed to bump? You can't take a bump. He wouldn't say it that clearly, but the, the meaning was there. So anyway, the last three moves were a complete disaster, and this was the best match I've seen either guy have up to that point. Explain that one to me, Lucy. Can't explain that to you. I really enjoyed the match. I like Osprey. I've liked a lot of his matches so far. And Will Hobbs never gets used right, so why not have him do a job to the guy in a stable and in the process get his face crushed? Yes. Good match, though. It went a while. I mean, I worry about... We've been watching a rating story. Osprey's good, but he hasn't really been presented the right way for a star to be introduced to a new audience on TV. The ratings keep going down. They open with the Edge Rara speech. <laughs> this is going to be an interesting episode. Let's win one for the sniffer. Who's the but sniffer? Then, Tony. Oh, very then, good. Very good. You know, Tony Clown has become very popular ever since I slipped and accidentally <laughs> said that on the show. A lot of the listeners have been sending that back at me. 
Tony Clown. But now we let's not overlook that after this match was over with, Hobbs was mad and went to shove old Willie, and Don Fallis had to get in and separate him, and they didn't seem too happy, so are they... But again, there's no explanation for why this hated heel that they were doing the same thing to Don Fallis a few months ago they've been doing to Dominic. They boo him out of the... Every time he tried to speak, boo, cover it up. They hate this guy. He's evil personified. But he's managing the newest, most high-priced baby face that is smiling and shaking hands with fans and people are cheering, but he's wrestling other guys in his stable. And the reason he's doing it is because the manager of the whole group is setting it up on purpose. And and this, I don't know that this is a what the fuck is going to happen in a good way because you're confused by the whole goddamn thing. You don't get... I just want to find out what's going on to get it over with. But it's not like I'm hanging on the next development. And then, as uh, Ostrich is on his way back through the entrance, here comes Danielson, and they pass. So now they're watching Raw, too. And they pass in the entranceway, and they're wrestling on the pay-per-view in, what, less than three weeks. And instead of having some kind of tension or issue, they smile at each other, and Ostrich says, top that. And the reason they're wrestling on the pay-per-view is they're going to have a classic match, apparently without doing any kind of angle to actually get people interested in seeing them fight with each other. So we got that going for us. Should I continue moving on to Mr. Danielson? Yes. Because Brian Danielson wrestled the formerly MIA Lance Archer. And thankfully, I wrote at the top, Lance came out with no Jake the Snake to get in the way and stand there and look larger and older than everyone else and do nothing. And Jake just announced he re-signed. Oh, yeah, he re-signed a contract, but he, that doesn't mean he has to come to work now. And then he, Archer didn't come out of the entrance way beating up a production assistant or some job guy because that's as we mentioned before so fucking phony and stupid so he didn't do that so i thought maybe we'll have a good match here and they jump start uh, archer jump starts before the bell and kicks the shit out of danielson for about two or three minutes straight and then danielson starts fighting back and they go to the floor and then the break spot is Danielson's down on the floor and Archer grabs some crew member standing there by the fucking railing and picks him up and body slams him on Brian Danielson. And that was the break spot. And at that point, I said, all right, I'm just going to again skip to the finish because what the... F Lance Archer is is a good talent. I'm not thinking he's the next rock or stone cold, but he could have been used well as a heel, especially in this land of Lilliput with these midgets and goddamn embryos on the card. No Jake Roberts to get in the way and detract attention from him. No goofy shit with the crew members. A sustained and focused push. And you could have had something, but you could say that about a lot of guys on this roster and it's too late now for Lance Archer like it is for most of the rest of the other ones and this wasn't a bad offensive match there was no furniture there was no flips everybody worked hard the fans liked it uh but finally Danielson <laughs> Lance Archer's on his knees in the middle of the ring and Danielson three kicks to the head and a running knee while Archer's on his knees and pins him one two three it's a rotten finish is flat. It's no way for Archer to take a bump, all those things. But in this case, it's Danielson's gimmick, and Danielson has been over in the past. So the people there liked it, and it wasn't as stupid as it would have been if some just jack-off did it. But Danielson didn't top it, except for... They didn't botch the last three consecutive moves. Danielson did not top Ostrich versus Hobbs with him versus Archer. Did you think he did? I didn't. I haven't been a big fan of Danielson's matches in quite a while. I thought the first match was much better. Well, in that case, 
We will move on to Chris Jericho with Rene Moxley Good. And another interview with Hook where Jericho comes out last week. I offered to be Hook's mentor, but he said something that stuck in my craw. And he brought out Hook to talk about it. And I'm not sure dressing like a juvenile delinquent uh, going to court is possibly helping Hook, but nevertheless, Jericho was upset because Hook said, I know who you are to him last week. And Jericho, of course, says, well, Hook, when you play the game at a high level, the rules are different. And I'm not asking you to trust me 100%, but believe in me as much as I believe in you. And Hook says he does believe, and that's why he got him a tag team match on Collision, which we're not going to watch. Nobody else will either. And Hook finished with, but I'm going to be keeping an eye on you. And then Jericho's like, that's the way I want it. So at this point now, can Jericho possibly turn on Hook and not bury Hook? Or are they going to fool us and Hook turns on Jericho? But they want to like Hook, so he shouldn't be a heel. And I don't know if they want to like Jericho anymore. And they maybe don't. he should be a heel. They don't. They don't pop for him. They boo him. Ever since he lost Judas, he lost his entire reaction. And when Jericho said, hit the hook signal, and they put it up, that's now getting a smaller reaction. Because well, because he's in, he's in the Jericho periphery right. there. The he's vortex. under the Jeridome. The Jericho vortex. <laughs> or tornado. You don't want to be in the path of that thing. But that was the first hour of the show. I mean, that, think about it. The Edge promo, the Osprey Hobbs match, the Danielson match, and this, that was the first hour of the show. Yeah. Ooh. But they're going to save us because... Remember, I've been asking, why the fuck did they try to make Jay White, the old light switch himself, a top heel, a single heel? Why were they giving him 20 minutes to talk and to work and to beat everybody? Well, now they've come to their senses. He got the shit kicked out of him by a 62-year-old man. Yeah, what was this match? This was something. It was a grudge. Apparently, on some show that they they do... The B show, C show, whatever. Jay White invaded Billy Gunn's home last week. How many home invasions have we just seen lately in wrestling? Yeah, LA Knight did it on SmackDown. What show was that on? Yeah, this this was on Rampage or whatever. Jay White showed up at Billy's house. I don't know. But this is a grudge match. And did they say that it was... No holes barred, anything goes, lazy booking, or did they just do it anyway? Did they ever say this is a no disqualification match? Oh, I don't know, because it was jump-started, so I don't remember, uh, I don't listen, the commentating, oh, let me just, I haven't said it in a while, Excalibur is so awful on commentary, I don't think anyone there truly acknowledges how much he turns off the viewer. Yeah. You can't listen to him. And then the Shivani just goes out there and says nothing. Just Tony Khan putting words in his mouth brings nothing to the table. The most mediocre commentary team, and they do more to hurt AEW than anyone wants to acknowledge. But when you tune into a wrestling show and the commentators are garbage, they're worthless, they can't do their job properly, it hurts the wrestling company. And then there's Taz sitting there in the middle going, yeah, the check is cashing, but I used to be on a real show. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway, what happened, for those of you who missed this piece of excitement, Billy Gunn jumpstarts this match and takes him outside, Jay White, out into the arena, on the floor, through the stands. They fought for what on my time counter on the DVR was seven minutes all through the arena without using the ring, rolled into the ring and rolled back out and went to break. And during the break, they pretty much, they were on the goddamn floor most of that time. When they came back, they were in the ring fighting for the first time on television in 10 minutes. And there, and of course, Aubrey Ed was the referee, and there she was standing and staring the whole time. You know, like I think she's ready for the glue factory. She has lost all of her authority. So then... 
Jay White got some offense for the very first time, but then Billy Gunn took back over. And suddenly on the screen, the acclaimed Caster and Bowens are in the locker room in the back, laying on the floor, writhing in pain, as one of the announcers said. And once he saw that, Billy then continued beating the shit out of Jay White and went out and got a chair. And as he comes back in with the chair, his sons, the gun boys, come in to cover Jay White up, and they're begging Billy, don't hit him, don't hit him. And then, while he, uh, Billy Gunn stops and pauses for a minute, you know, trying to get his kids out of the way, Jay White comes in with a nut shot. And then the referee rings the bell. She went, nay, you can't do that. They have fought in the arena for seven minutes straight without using the ring. Then the guy comes in the ring with a chair. Then people that are not even involved in the match come into the ring. None of that's a disqualification. But once the guy gets hit in the nuts, fuck it. I got to ring the bell. She is the shit. She's worse than Knox. Because it no, least, she's not. Come on. Yes, she is. No. Because here's the thing. Think about this. Knox, between the fact that he's rotten, but he's also so skinny and pale and bald and looks like a desiccated corpse, that he, he's almost translucent. You can see through him. He doesn't stand out. You can ignore him. But you can't ignore this fucking little filly of Aubrey Ed because she's always prancing and dancing and taking her stances and flipping her mane about and making her faces and gestures and pointing and, and stomping her hooves. You can't ignore her. So she's worse than Knox. But anyway, the bell rang, and then the heels got on Billy Gunn, but the acclaimed, who were <laughs> writhing in pain on the locker room floor on the screen a couple minutes ago, hit the ring fine and make a save they have a sloppy fight they throw the heels to the floor tear up the desk and are about to put jay white through the desk when the guns save and the heels run off and this was a mess but more importantly my god they beat the shit out of jay white or billy did and then when the heels tried to get some heat the baby faces came back and kicked the shit out of them ran them off again what the fuck was this Atrocious, awful, bad use of the nine o'clock hour. Oh, there's a bunch of things I could say. Billy Gunn is his age. He probably shouldn't be in singles matches. He, well, he was he was the best worker in the ring. That's the problem. <sighs> this whole he was still was the problem. best worker in the ring. You know, I don't really care too much about the acclaimed bang bang gang feud. I hope Juice Robinson, when he comes back, is not with any of these people. That's the problem. Every time someone leaves AEW for an injury or something. You're always like, when they come back, I hope they do something completely different than everything they have done so far. But what happened to, does he need a kidney transplant, Juice? What happened to him? It was his back, I think, wasn't it? Oh, boy, I don't know, but it's not, uh, not promising. Anyway, that's, that happened there. And then I've got to admit... Maybe you can fill me in because I didn't watch the first of this. I just watched it when the money came out. But Renee Moxley Good was on the stage there with Willow Nightingale and Chris Statlander, who doesn't speak at all, just stands there. Why is she there? Um, please break her out of the... Please send her to the Performance Center so she would have a career. Anyway, and Stokely Hathaway. And... I started fast-forwarding this because I don't give two shits about what these people have to say. But then here came Mercedes Moan out to join them. So I stopped. So what was Willow saying? Did Willow explain in any way, Brian, what the bad blood is between her and Mercedes Moan since Mercedes has not wanted to give us any details? It's Mercedes Monet, or Monet, as you well know already. No, what Willow did, I wish you would have seen this, was she is an yet another person to give an acceptance speech. Oh, boy. To give their valedictorian speech, to talk about all the struggles they've been through and work in small shows, and mm. it's the same thing everyone's doing. You don't want... Wrestlers never did this. Now everyone does it. 
I want to talk about the things I dreamt about growing up. We never heard about childhood dreams until Shawn Michaels. Yeah. And now it's all we hear about. And it wasn't even probably really his childhood dream. Vince loved that tagline. Vince loved that statement. Well, she gave, you know, she's very, you know, seems very happy. And uh, they shot it differently so you could see the crowd behind them. Well, they shot it differently so you could see the people behind them. I don't know if I'd call it a crowd. I think that's the only shot they could take. I mean, again, that fucking camera was tighter than the fucking skin on a hot dog on that crowd. But go ahead. That was really it. Well, then Mercedes came out, regardless of how you want to pronounce it. It's money, all right. Outgoing money. It's an expenditure. She stood next to Willow three, four feet away, right, with the announcer in between them, without looking at her in an unnatural... But she wasn't looking at the camera either, and she was turned. It looked like she was staring... To the people in the building, she was staring at the empty entranceway because they're on the stage with the people in back. So Willow is just staring at an empty, or Mercedes staring at an empty doorway to the people in the building. And she, again, gave a recited, prepared set of comments with no emotion and not saying anything other than Whoever wins the title match between Willow and whoever the fuck at this pay-per-view, she wants a title match at the next pay-per-view. And then she did her little stripper dance and and she was gone. Millions of dollars, Brian? What the fuck is going on here? I was told by someone in AEW that she's not getting paid anywhere near what the rumors are. So we can Is she getting just say paid that. is she getting paid more than fourteen dollars an hour? See, now you're being ridiculous. Now you're just being silly. Of course. So she is. far what I've seen, you could get a cashier at fucking Target dressed up and have her do the same thing. Fourteen bucks an hour, maybe in the big cities. She has not it's been the law of diminishing returns each and every week. It's a month now. The first promo was in her hometown and got a good reaction. This is just up the road, Worcester Mass. Got a nice reaction, but she's not moving the ratings. She can't explain anything. She does, she's everyone's still talking about her on commentary last week, saying nothing. Not not good things about her on commentary no, either. No, so the women's division still remains a problem, and I think you know it, it's hard to compare the two, but she has, at least to me, the positive momentum of her went away a lot quicker than it did off like Paige when she came in. Where's Paige? I don't know. Collecting her check. What do you think? Oh my God. Well, whether it's millions or hundreds of thousands or whatever it is, at this point, it's, it's TV time that's being taken up. Is it not for no good reason or purpose? But that's a pretty good transition to the next match, Brian, the tag team tournament match. This is the semifinals, apparently. Uh, the Lollipop Guild versus the Puddin' Gang. The Buckaroos, Maddie and Nikki, against Pockets and Trent, because Muffin Top Taylor is still... Well, he's always been unable to wrestle, but now he's not medically cleared either. And the baby faces came out with Trent's mother, Sue, who bakes the cookies and drives a minivan. How much do you think they have to pay Trent to put up with being portrayed as a complete bumbling fucking idiot on national television? I don't know. If you had tried to pitch this angle or program to any other babyface in the recorded history of wrestling, they would have quit on the spot before they would have their mother drive them to the show in a minivan or second them at ringside and and give a fake slap to one of the EVPs. Uh, but anyway, the idea that that this of all weeks, where the comments have been made about this company and that they are clearly defensive about, that they would allow this, not only these immature, emotionally stunted, egomaniacal pricks to present 
this exhibition of mud show wrestlers and bad comedy when the WWE's on fire and the prevailing opinion of their company is that it's a joke company run for the benefit of its indie level wrestlers. And if you're friends with the right people, you can get jobs, whether you're ready for television or not. And then they put this match on TV. Does Tony Khan have no clue what this looks like to adult impartial wrestling fans? It's like, I can see the rock on one channel and I'm watching kids play with their mother on the other channel for the tag team title is and, and big surprise. The Buckaroos won. They beat Trent. Who's still again, the only guy in this ring that's worth a shit, but he's been buried long ago. And then, so now the finals, by the way, surprise, surprise, are going to be the Buckaroos and FTR. The Buckaroos will beat FTR, and then since Moxley, did, did, you know, basically refused to be in the tournament so they wouldn't have to do a job, then the Buckaroos can fight the other guys that haven't been beat yet, and FTR does another job. But having said that, here the Puddin' Gang goes for their big hug, and Trent ran in leveled pockets with a big knee. And Taylor stands there with just a blank look on his pudding filled face like i don't i don't know what to do so i won't react at all to anything even though my friends are fighting and trent walks off on the whole thing and his mother is standing there at ringside this match of all matches on the week where they've been accused of being nothing but a vanity project for people's friends and they do 20 minutes of national TV that's a vanity project for people's friends. There's not one motherfucker here that deserves to be on goddamn national television on a wrestling show or any other kind of show, whether it be Maddie and Nikki, Pockets, Trent, Muffin Top, or his cookie bacon fucking mother. Is that, can you tell me I just told a lie? Which one of these motherfuckers deserves to be on a nationally televised wrestling program? None of them would be on my program. So they did that. Did I miss anything discussing it? I guess the only other thing in note, some of the listeners sent this over. I missed it when it first aired because I usually have it on mute. The Bucks, when they came out, I guess shouted out the scapegoat, Jack Perry. Again, of all days <laughs> to do it, they shout him out here, and it's just, again, it's... Okay, but now, now wait a minute. And, and, and their boss, Tony Khan, is mad at Jack Perry and won't bring Jack Perry back. So his direct underlings his evps are shouting out the guy that the boss is mad at on the boss's tv that the boss pays for unless tony's not that mad at him anymore that's the other thing you have to take uh -huh. into consideration but you know that's the thing they got what they wanted everyone always makes like the the bucks wanted to do this and change this no they just wanted to get as much money as they could for themselves and their family and their friends and their friends but really about themselves it's always yeah. been and about themselves and well, they try and to pretend I, I, like it isn't. I don't want to. I don't necessarily want to say they're friends as much as they're stooges. The people that prop them up, the people that write them the love letters, on how they hung the sun and the moon and the stars. And hey. but it's bad. It's minor league. If you tune into this show, it's like something you would have seen on the worst moments of TNA. The Bucks putting on wacky outfits and wacky personas to pretend they're vice presidents, even though they are. It doesn't even seem like it. And just wrestle matches that don't do it anymore. Everyone can get a pop when you do a flip and you land on your head. But to actually tell a story in your match, that's always been an issue with them because they always have to, like, break every rule. When we say the rules, the things that make wrestling wrestling, like a referee enforcing rules, no, everything just happens nonstop because otherwise we can't get our great ideas out there. That's yeah. bullshit. And now they get less reaction than ever before. Because you've seen it. And they don't draw any... They're, they're getting paid more than any tag team in history. They mean less than ever before. <laughs> and no one would pay to see them. It's incredible. And but, they, but that's what they wanted. They were just all, they were in this for the money. A lot of people want to pretend it's not. When you hear Adam Copeland go out there in the opening and say, we're all here. There's a reason. And he starts listing people. There's a reason we all came here. Yeah, there is. Yes. Tony gave you a whole lot more money, Adam, than they were going to give you in WWE. 
Tony let you do what you wanted instead of pushing it down to the mid card because you weren't drawing as a main eventer. Work one day a week, have fun with your friends, and do mostly whatever you want. That is the, and like we said, that's either the the wrestling legends exit plan and retirement strategy or the guys who have never been on television of any repute whatsoever are happy to be on big time TV in between he his, he's running out of options. Nobody with a valid career and choices to go to the WWE or even maybe do their own thing in other companies that won't be where they 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 won't hand their careers to Tony Khan just for the sake of getting on television. Those people aren't going to want to go there if they're serious about their fucking career. There's too many intangibles. You can you can be talented in this environment and still be hidden and buried because of the bad show, the bad creative, and whose friend are you? How did Maria May? get to be in contention for the number one contendership for the title held by her idol and boss and reason for living Tony Storm. Because now it was Mar Mariah, Maria, is it Maria, Mariah? Mariah. And they called the wind Mariah. Mariah May versus Thunder Rosa. And the winner gets a title, is the number one contender to get a title shot at Tony Storm. Why does Maria May want a title shot? Mariah, we just established Mariah. that. All right, well, whichever. Why does she want a title shot against Tony Storm? Tony is her idol. Have we explained that? How did no, none and of this how did makes any go, sense? Nothing's been explained. How did explained. she go from an unknown fan who was idolizing Tony Storm to the goddamn? Number one contendership in 12 weeks. Uh, Thunder Rosa, however, won with her finish. So we've been saved against that potential conflict of interest. Does this make any sense? Probably not. But again, I don't really watch a lot of the Tony Storm segments because they started to make me hate them. Did, do, would you have put Maria May and Thunder Rosa on right in front of your main event contract signing angle for your world title match on pay-per-view? No, I think that the problem is that the women's segment, no matter who was in it, whether it's Mariah May or Thunder Rosa or anyone else, you've trained the audience that when you get to that segment between 9 and 10 o'clock, you could tune out. And usually they do. So that's the bigger issue. It's not even who's in it. It's the entire division. Well, and the problem is this time they didn't have a big match to come back to at the end. They had a big contract signing. And by the time they came back for this thing, for the entrances for Swerve and Samoa Joe, there was six minutes, five minutes left on the air. So they did Swerve's entrance, then Joe's entrance. Then both of them sat down. Joe signed the contract. The fans chanted Swerve's house. And Joe started speaking at 9.59 p.m. And he said, Swerve, I'm going to give you some advice before you sign that contract. You're working on bad information. The truth is signing that contract is going to be a big mistake. And my DVR froze. <laughs> so... Apparently, what happened afterwards, and Brian, tell me if this is accurate, because I tried to read the recap, was that Swerve said he's going to win the title and blah, blah, blah. And then they started fighting, and Swerve got busted open, but he made a comeback and signed the contract in his own blood, and then Joe came back to the ring and kicked the shit out of him again. Well, Joe kicked the shit out of him, bloodied him up, and Swerve bleeds tremendously. We've seen it a few times now. We've seen even people drink it. And then Swerve got up all it's, bloody. I understand, I understand it's excellent with, with a shot of bitters over ice. And then Swerve got up all bloody to let Joe know that he's not worried about him. He likes this. So that's the big setup for the big match. Did, did, did Joe come back in the ring and kick the shit out of him again? Now I don't know. Now I'm not sure. On the recap I read, he came back and kicked the shit out of him again. 
So it's fine if you kick the shit out of the baby face and make him bleed, but then he gets up and signs the contract in his blood and said, is that all you got? I'm ready for some more. That's fine. But if Joe goes back and kicks the shit out of him again, then that baby face is a goddamn idiot, isn't he? Yeah. Well, hold on. Let me find the goddamn article that I was reading. If I can, it's already been moved off the page. My God, a lot of news going on in the world of wrestling these days. Let me click up here. I've clicked, and now... Yep, it clearly says right here, Brian. I found it instantly. Took me only seconds. Joe leaves the ring, swerves, grabs a mic, swerves, grabs, swerve, grabs a mic, says he loves this stuff. If that's all you got, I'm going to take the title from you. Signs the contract in his blood. Right. Joe returns to the ring and puts Swerve through the table. Oh, see, I tuned out. <laughs> after Swerve made the comeback all bloody on the mic, I tuned it out. I missed the okay. last minute or so, I guess. Yeah, he came back and ran him through another fucking table. So what the... <laughs> God damn it. You know, the other thing, too, it's important to note, the ratings have gone down. and Everyone has different things to blame, but you can look at other things. Things that are hot, the ratings don't go down like this. It's because the product's cold, the TV's cold. The more they've introduced shit after 10 o'clock, and again, this is a DVR for a lot of people like you, like me, if you set your DVR for Dynamite, it's not going to record the thing after it. It's not going to record the overrun that's not in the schedule. More and more people started missing that stuff. The ratings keep going down. If you're doing main event stuff and it's after everyone's DVR work, don't assume everyone's going to go to YouTube and seek it out. I guess that's the other thing. Well, and that's, you know, at least they've got time. They can play this back if they think of it. They can play it back next week on television, but it would be better if they if they didn't not only, you, you can advertise a match. You can advertise Samoa Joe versus Swerve Strickland. Stay at it to the end of the show here. You're going to see this match. But when you advertise a contract signing, you can't come out and say, now, you know they're going to fight. You pretty much know they're going to fight. But then when you fucking not only do that, but you run it over to the allotted time period of the program and and into the next time period of the next program, the DVR people miss it. Plus people are, what the fuck? I I almost thought, because I try not to pay attention to the announcers, because as you mentioned, they're bothersome. But when I saw Maria May and Thunder Rosa at 20 minutes till, I'm like, this is the fucking main event. I forgot they had the contract deal because we only got five minutes of it in the regular time slot. So if you're doing all kinds of great business, that's one thing, right? Are you there? Yeah, that's one thing. I, I'm sorry. I heard I heard a swoosh. Oh, a thing oh. swooshed into my screen. Yeah, it wasn't me. I wasn't swooshing. I have a notification of a swoosh. I don't know. It made that swooshy noise like I'd got disconnected. But anyway, that... <laughs> It, 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 the ratings continue to go down on the program. The farther down, the farther into the program you get, the farther down they go on most normal weeks. And the only reason the overrun has a bump is because there's a bunch of people tuned in, think they're going to see, I don't know, it's howdy duty time, whatever the program is. You're not probably not going to sell them the pay-per-view. They're just like, can we get this bullshit off so I can see my movie? So anyway, That was dynamite. I'm ready to blow my nose. All right. Well, that was dynamite, and you can blow your nose because we will return in the future with the AEW Dynamite Ratings. Does this one stop? All right, stop. Oh, it didn't stop. We lower it. We are in the future. Yes, friends, he was a great man, gone too soon. Well, we are in the, are you talking about the AEW ratings? I'm not no, sure. I thought, I thought that was, we were stepped into a funeral there when we got out of the time machine. Well, it may be, actually. We're going to talk about the AEW Dynamite ratings for April 3rd, 2024 in a moment. But Jim, we have to reference something from a little earlier. Well, talk- yeah, I, I realized when we were taking our intergalactic journey through the space-time continuum and hit the left turn at Albuquerque on the warp, that I'd uh, alluded to a story that I was going to tell that you hadn't heard or 
couldn't remember. And then we never fucking did it. And I thought we ought to clean that up before we go any further. So if the people got to the end of this program and didn't hear it and had actually given a shit, they wouldn't be saying, what the fuck? Right? So what I was trying to say earlier was with Edge cutting that promo in defense of Tony and the company and its raison d'etre for living. And it, it, I understand Dax cut a promo off the air after the show saying, well, if it wasn't for AEW, I wouldn't be spending time with my family. I mean, okay. I'm not sure that's a defense for the place that everybody wants to go and work with their friends and have fun. But the point, I said, they are, they're divining themselves. And divining yourself is a phrase that I coined in TNA back in 2006, 2007, whatever it was. It's to unnecessarily, through your own mouth, call attention to bad shit about you that a lot of people may not have heard and, except you brought it up. Or stooging yourself is what it could be shorter for, for those of you smart to the wrestling lingo. And do you remember Johnny Devine? He was the, one of the Canadian guys was with Scott Demore's Canadian group. I remember the name more than I remember the actual wrestler, but I remember uh, well, the name. A nice guy and, and a good, good worker and et cetera. But it was the night, the TNA pay-per-view that Scott Hall no-showed and Kevin Nash and Samoa Joe got in a fight. And when I say fight, a very sharp, loud, profane, pointed, verbal confrontation. And I think Nash pie faced Joe, and it was in front of a lot of the guys in that fucking, the, the trailers that served as locker rooms. It, because Hall had no-showed the tag match, main event of the pay-per-view. Surprise, surprise. And Joe was supposed to give a a promo at the start explaining why that whatever the reason was, it was going to be changed to whoever the fuck was in it. Right. And in the process of doing that, Joe pissed off because his fucking guy no showed what it was. It, again, these young guys were doing the work and carrying this thing. And it was the impression that the WWE guys just came in, made the money, jacked off vacation, whatever. There's something to that, but nevertheless, Joe gets fucking pointed on a promo about Hall at the start, and pisses Nash off without even, I think, really knowing that he had done that. He was just venting at the guy that no-showed the pay-per-view and fucked his match up. And then afterwards, Nash goes in, starts cutting a promo on Joe, and, that's, and it gets heated and ugly or whatever. So the next day, at TV, they call a meeting because Joe does, Samoa Joe prides himself on being not only a professional, but an adult and conducting himself in a certain manner, and he felt he wanted to apologize not only to Nash for things he had said, but also in, in front of the, the, the company and the group, the boys, and, you know, for his behavior in that setting. And every, from Dixie was there on down, Jeff and Dutch, and then, uh, you know, uh, the producers, the referees, all the wrestlers, Joe stands up, gives a very impassioned apology to everybody for conducting himself in that manner. He's a professional and he doesn't want to set a bad example for that. Very well received. They gave him a round of applause. I think Dixie gave him a hug. And, and the meeting was over, right? And suddenly, swept up in the fucking emotion of this cathartic, soul-bearing journey that joe had taken us on or maybe just seeing well he got a round of applause maybe i can yeah you know, i don't know what was going through his head johnny divine stands up and raises his hand up uh, i just like to apologize for my behavior also oh my god fast forward re rewind to the previous night right after this fucking pay-per-view hall no shows main events chaos afterwards me and Dutch are always the last ones out of there. I've got, I've taken a shower because it's always fucking hot in Orlando, whatever the fuck. It's like one o'clock in the morning now and I've got to eat. I'm going to Wendy's. And I, as I go down in the elevator at the double tree and I come out of the elevator there in the lobby is Dutch Mantel talking to two or three uniformed police officers 
First time I've ever seen uniformed police officers in the lobby of the Double Tree in Orlando, so I know it's not just a chance meeting. I duck behind one of the columns because I want to see what's going on, but I don't want them to see me. I don't want to be called over for conversation here, but if Dutch breaks and runs for it, I got the car keys in my fucking pocket, and I'll scream, Dutch, this way! But they're just, it's obvious it's not a confrontational conversation. They're talking, so I'm thinking, ah, oh, there's some trouble with one of the boys, and Dutch is finding out what's going on because he's the the representative here. I'm sure Shitstain was asleep in his bed somewhere, potentially about to wet it, uh, dreaming of, you know, writing his TV the next day. So I go on to Wendy's because I'm hungry. And when I come back, there's no cops there. Okay. So the next morning, I picked, I'm meeting Dutch in the lobby, and I get the story. What did that? Johnny Devine had gotten out earlier, or whatever, the previous night, and they, they put the, the main event guys and the main event office people in the double tree. But they put the underneath guys over at the, down the, over, around the corner at the Holiday Inn Express. Johnny Devine has gone into the Holiday Inn Express, and it, the lobby is like the size of my bathroom, right? It's a, it's a little fucking... And somehow he's made enough of a stink about something to the front desk girl that he, she's not only... He's made her cry, but also the police have been called because he was pitching a fit and don't you know who I am? And then they, the police have been directed to his supervisor over at the double tree where dutch could try to talk him down i think maybe he had come over that direction and they had followed him over there so anyway the point is it wasn't a big goddamn deal no one was injured they he offended the girl at the desk and was told in no uncertain terms to apologize and wasn't going to get tna kicked out of the holiday Inn express Dixie didn't know any of this happened, right? She was, He stood up, he said, I just also like to apologize for my behavior. And you saw Dixie turn to, to Jeff, like, what behavior? <laughs> and I really, I, I shouldn't have conducted myself that way also, and I wouldn't mean to bring any shame or embarrassment on the company. And again, you see her turn, what shame? What embarrassment? <laughs> <laughs> and he apologized to everybody and he's standing there waiting for the fucking round of applause that doesn't come because everybody's buried their face in their hands like you fucking idiot you've just stooged yourself we half the boys didn't really know about it and and it didn't go any farther i think dutch told jeff and jeff wasn't going to tell dixie and then the meeting broke up and and you know, you remember you said you remember Johnny Devine's name? I don't think he's wrestled in the United States since then. Oh no, really? I mean, no, I, I he wasn't there long after that, and I hadn't seen or heard of his name in a long. Johnny Devine, are you out there? I liked him; he's a good kid. But goddamn, that was hilarious. After, especially, it was like trying to follow the Gettysburg Address with a goddamn C-SPAN fucking speech. And he, and again, he, he stooged his own self for something that had already been covered, covered and dealt with. And it all ties back to AEW because if you're an AEW fan or just a wrestling fan and you have not watched the CM Punk interview or read wrestling newsletters or anything or websites, yes. you have no idea what's going on. And all of a sudden these wrestlers are like, I'll get back to the wrestling in a moment. I want to tell you how happy I am to be here and why you should all be happy that I'm here. <laughs> They're jumping up and down, calling a attention to something that maybe just could have blown over if they just give it a week or two and go on about their business. But they had to jump in. And and when your whole thing is, you know, don't say anything bad about Tony. You got to love it here because they pay me and give me the right to feed my family. You know what? You could say it about any boss at any job anywhere in the world. Don't say anything bad about Mr. Smithers. He may torture people, but because of him, I can put food on the table for my family. Yes, it, it, they, it, they eat only the finest gruel. Farm-to-table gruel. Well, let's talk about farm-to-table gruel. AEW <laughs> Dynamite in Worcester, Massachusetts. 
Worcester, by the way, do we have, before we get to the numbers, do we have a crowd? Did anybody even ever, was there a crowd there? Actually, I do have something kind? here. Uh, and this is, uh, was Re this the, uh, Worcester? Was this the, what's the name of the building there? Well, the DCU Centrum Center. Was, the DCU oh, well, Center is what it says That's here. one of those new places they've built in the last 40 or 50 years. I haven't seen those. Well, I have information here from WrestleNomics as well as WrestleTix. And the last three shows in the market... Uh, for both companies, April 15th, 2022, SmackDown, 6,738. 72722 for Dynamite, 6,143. Comparable. October 2022 for SmackDown, once again, 6,261. That's the same thing they'd done before. And AEW Dynamite, April 3rd, 2024, 3,252. Ouch! All in the same building. About half of what they did before. Yeah. Okie dokie. Well, what, what's the number? Certainly they're, they're up this week with the appearance of Will Ostrich and Mercedes Moan. And who's that? Oh, Okada went back to Japan. So he's collecting whatever. If he's a couple million dollars, he's collecting 50 or 100 grand a week to stay home. Well, you can't blame him. That was the <laughs> that was the offer that Tony said. He goes, I can go work for WWE and move to Florida, or Tony will give me all this money. I got to fly to Japan for a month. <laughs> Jim and there's a truck or something in the background. It'll pass. AEW Dynamite on TBS Wednesday, April third, twenty twenty four, eight to ten o five p.m. On average, seven hundred and fifty two thousand viewers. Oh boy, howdy! What what happened there? Uh, and for the record, this is up 1% from last week, which was 747,000, and it is 4% under the trailing four-week average of 781. Everything ooh. is trending down. The crowds, the ratings, everything. So that was not an anomaly last week. It's the, it's the start of a, uh, a fashion trend. Let's not watch AEW. Well, Jim, let's go to these trends right here. Yeah, but did did they start lower? Did they start significant? Did the did the air come out of the Big Bang? I would have to double check. I almost think it may have been around where they started last week, but you may remember better. Quarter one, eight to eight fifteen p.m. These are compiled by WrestleNomics. The Adam Copeland live rah rah promo, followed by Powerhouse Hobbs versus Will Ospreay. Nine hundred and thirty-three thousand viewers. That's about where they started. Uh, well, that's about where they've started uh, numerous weeks and still stayed above eight. Quarter two, eight fifteen, eight thirty p.m. The continuation of Hobbs versus Osprey with picture-in-picture -picture ads, and the post-match with Don Callis, followed by an ad break. Seven hundred and sixty-one thousand viewers. Oh, there's what's gonna happen. That's not normal. Um. I can't do this math. 130, 160. Wait a minute. Uh, 139 and 33 is 172. 172,000 people after the first 15 minutes. You have to think, even if you were tuning in, that edge speech may have run some people off just because what it went on for a while and what was it? It went nowhere. It, it was frantic almost kind of uh, panicked please don't pay attention to the burning deck of the ship it almost was like a plead for people to please come on come on it i'm here a, yes. you like me that's i'm just i'm telling you so that and and will osprey uh eh. and by the way tony khan was asked today on the media call for the uh for for something or other about the cm punk comments he won't comment on it so he can't comment on the comments? No, he can comment. Tony is scared to comment on anything that doesn't portray everything in a glowing light, and it's hard to do that when someone else is telling the truth. Jim Quarter 3, 8.30 to 8.45 p.m. Brian Danielson versus Lance Archer with Picture in Picture. 756,000 viewers. Oh. It, <sighs> Brian Danielson's one of their big names, but... No, he's not. It, well, <laughs> on he paper, used to he, be. Should, he should be. They booked him like shit, and now he's meaningless. Now he just works long competitive matches with everyone. So Brian Danielson means less than he ever did before in AEW as far as being a draw, because you've seen it all already. Remember when he was given those great live interviews in the ring, and we were like, oh, that's, and 
you never hear him speak unless it's a pre-tape or, you know. He did those great interviews for a few weeks, and then he disappeared, and then he was a babyface, and then he put him with the Blackpool Combat Club, and that was it. He's just been in limbo ever since. Nothing happening. Quarter 4, 8.45 to 9 p.m., the ending of Danielson versus Archer, an ad break, the Chris Jericho hook ramp promo, the Shane Taylor Promotions backstage promo, and the start of Billy Gunn versus Jay White. 743,000 viewers. Ooh. So we've... What we've done here is we've lost 190, right? 933 to 743, 190,000 people in one hour. That's right. And again, a lot of people are telling Tony that nothing's being done wrong. Ratings are down for everyone. Don't worry about it. They're not helping Tony. They're denying the reality, which is he's doing a horrible job as being a promoter and a booker right now. Quarter five, the big nine o'clock hour, nine to nine, 15 p.m. The continuation of Gun versus White. <laughs> it was that was that a continuation or was it a fucking evisceration? I've never seen a motherfucker get beat so bad. He was beaten like he owed Billy Gun trans. Well, it also had picture in picture ads and then a post match with the guns, the acclaimed. Uh, or just that, the guns and the acclaimed. The Young Bucks' best friends backstage angle, followed by Willow Nightingale's ramp promo. You know, I thankfully, I believe I zipped through that. I saw them and didn't bother to watch it. Yeah, I must have missed that too. I don't remember what that is. But then the the uh, beginning of the Nightingale promo on the ramp, 780,000 viewers. So, okay, so they picked up 37,000 at the top of the hour. Brand new shot at retaining these people, yeah. new viewers. Let's see what they and then, what they do from here. And how would you run off the audience if you had if someone said Jim, run off the audience as quick as you can? You put the women and the young bucks out there, and that's what they did. Quarter six, nine fifteen and nine thirty p.m. The continuation and the uh, appearance of Mercedes Monet during the Nightingale Stokely Hathaway Statlander ramp promo and ad break, and the start of the Young Bucks versus Orange Cassidy and Trent Beretta. <laughs> With picture in picture, 697,000 viewers. Oh my God. You know, I mean, it's hard to deny that the Buckaroos are a ratings drop, and it's hard to deny that the general women's segment and the second part of the show is a ratings drop. But when you put those two factors together, they're unstoppable. I mean, people can't stay. You, you could tie people to the fucking television. They wouldn't stay. This is only going to get worse. <laughs> For those who don't realize it, the more you put the bucks out there, they're not going to ever cause more people to tune in. They chase people away. The women's division, the same thing. Jim Quarter 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m. The continuation of the Young Bucks versus Cassidy and Beretta. The post-match with Chuck Taylor. An ad break and the start of Thunder Rosa versus Mariah May, 711,000 viewers. So they got back 14,000. So, you know, should we give them a round of applause for that? Prob they're they're, they're 222,000 down for the show. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Quarter eight, and I remind you, we have a five, uh, it says here six minutes, it said before five, but a six-minute overrun. Quarter 8, 9.45 to 10 p.m., the continuation of Rosa versus May, with picture-in-picture -picture ads, Penta El Zero Miedo's backstage promo, and the start of the Swerve Strickland Samoa Joe Live contract signing for the main event of the upcoming pay-per-view. 655,000 viewers, <laughs> as well as the low-in-the-key demo of 278,000 viewers, six-minute mm -hmm. overrun, Continuation of the angle, 708,000 viewers. Oh, boy, howdy. So, in regulation, not counting overtime, they lost 278,000 viewers from the start. Is that what, did I do that math right? Well, taking out the first quarter and the overrun, 729,000 is the average. So that's their new uh, their new base audience this week is 729, taking out the artificial insemination of the beginning and the 
and the overrun at the end? You know, one or two things, because it's not, you know, just two things being equal because of the differences in the shows and differences in the audiences, but NXT is one or two things away from passing AEW Dynamite in the ratings. You know, they're always in the sixes. AEW is coming to me- there to meet them. AEW Dynamite's ratings are coming to meet Rampage and Collision. Wait. You know what? That is actually a, a wonderful olive branch for AEW offer. Hey, we'll meet you in the middle. <laughs> if you can't get any more viewers, we'll run some of ours off. That way it's more competitive. Listen, no star power. I think Will Ospreay, who I've enjoyed in the ring, and I think the fans like him on the promos, I think he can be a star. He has not been presented well as a star in AEW so far. Adam Copeland? Again, he returned to WWE. They thought we have another main eventer coming back in Edge. The fans really didn't see him that way. And now he's in AEW. The enthusiasm's obviously down. And he gave just a rambling, sweaty, you know, almost like, you know, he's, he couldn't think of what to say. And the mic started going dead. Just that segment was death. Danielson means nothing right now. The BCC and the booking have killed Danielson. Billy Gunn versus Jay White was the nine o'clock hour match. <laughs> Someone just said, that, well, the nine o'clock hour was the biggest quarter it, it number, except for the, the open. It was and to see Billy Gunn beat the complete teetotal shit out of Chris Jericho's dead on arrival right now. They're going to drag hook right down with them. There's nothing they could do that will repair that the women's division. They spend whatever amount of money on Mercedes Mer- Monet Mer- Merna- Mernal? <laughs> Mercedes she Mermaid? F- F.W. Mernal's third wife? Mercedes Mermaid. And uh, they spent all this money. People are like, oh, they'll give more time to the women's division now. Why would you? Why would you? Why would you put more time into something that always makes people leave the TV? Well, she can't fill two minutes of time without going blank. Uh, speaking, why would you give her more time? How far is Boston from Worcester? Oh God, nothing as far from, uh, is it, is that the one that's like, uh, Springfield is 50 miles or whatever. Well, it's not that far. Nothing's that far up there. Just like because it they, is in normal states. They drew that good house in Boston for her debut. They're in Massachusetts. You would think there'd be some kind of rollover or something. Well, well, it, four it, weeks ago. Well, but wait a minute. That was her debut and it was in her hometown. Have you been Boston traffic? Not a lot of people in Boston are going to Worcester to see their goddamn kids graduate college much less to see Mercedes come out and moan again. But uh, so I don't expect a lot of crossover there, but what reason? I bet people in Boston, except if they don't watch the TV, they didn't even know this show was taking place because of their promotional efforts or lack thereof for the live event portion of these things. Then you got the Bucks versus Best Friends. The Bucks are dead. The Bucks drive viewers away. The Bucks cause people not to want to watch the show. Now, wait a minute. Do not single them out when everything you just said applies to the Pudding Gang, too. Well, you know what? I don't even think... I don't think it applies to the Pudding Gang because I think they're not entities. Orange Cassidy is different than the rest of them because he's been pushed all over the TV. The other two are just bodies that are there. Orange Cassidy, even if you're a fan of his... I'll give it to you, even if you're a fan of his. The law of diminishing returns. Why would anyone after five years still want to see this guy? They don't. The women's match. And then Swerve and Samoa Joe's angle. Swerve was the hottest babyface in the company a few weeks ago. Does it still feel that way? Does it still feel that way to you? That he's the hottest babyface and the one person there who has something happening. Something going on. I love the idea of doing an angle at the contract signing to heat up the pay-per-view main event, but at the same time, again, like we said earlier, when he gets beat up and bloodied and then gets up defiant, signs a contract in his, in his own blood, and then the heel comes in and just lays him out again, they went one step too far. That's how they cool people off. And that's AEW Dynamite. So where's the star power that's going to help them? Where? John Moxley's been off TV for a while. He'll probably reappear after the tournament. That's not going to help anymore. Those days of Moxley really being a help and a mover are done. MJF? If done right, an MJF return could mean a lot. Here's the problem. Who's he going to work with? Who? You got Adam Cole. He's still getting ready to come back. Nobody wants to see Adam Cole ever again at this point in time. It's that's a tragedy how they presented him and that whole black scorpion fiasco. 
Kenny Omega, they brought up his name on the last several episodes. Kenny Omega is one of their top guys in the history of their company. And now we're hearing that he is probably going to have an operation on his intestines. He ain't coming back anytime soon. Abushi, he's been a non-entity in AEW. Can't Wait a minute, no. No, remember, he's comfortably laid up with double ankle surgery. Right. And I was going to be out for at least a year. Well, he's not going to be there for a long time. But even before that, my point was he was a non-entity. They signed him and made a big deal out of him. He looked awful in the ring and the fans didn't care. Tony's now saying he's going to be in there with every free agent that becomes available. <laughs> All he could do is throw money at them because if you want to be treated seriously, if you want good booking, if you want structure, if you want the ability to rise up, momentum to be captured, what show do you want to be on right now? You know, there are two ships that go in different ways. I, you know... Uh... Bad. It didn't. Just bad. It didn't have to be this way. All he had to do was recognize that you can finance whatever you want and be a hero if you don't sabotage it at the same time by doing multiple things that you don't have the experience or the capability for. There's a difference on it and impressing your friends with your e-fed booking and. Doing a national TV show in an NBA arena. Fuck. How did anybody not see this from the God? That's that is what I saw from the start. And nobody believed me. And $150 million or so will delay the inevitable for some time. But it's still a guy that won't listen because he thinks he's an expert and has never done this before and shows no capability to learn if anybody's there to teach him or if he gets to be petulant if anybody criticizes it or just if he doesn't listen see that's the problem right there the people that tony turns to the people that he wants to hear advice from the people that he's been reading for a long time that he turns to to hear what they say none of them have helped him because again if you're pretending that tony could fix things and that the problems aren't tony if you can't acknowledge all the real issues, you're part of the problem. And these are the people Tony turns to. Tony wants to hear what Meltzer is going to say or how Meltzer is going to word things or all these things. And then he runs with it. Meanwhile, look at the Observer. You want to talk about out of touch? The Observer is a dying thing. People don't talk about it. People don't subscribe to it the same way they used to. Well, and it, it, it's, Dave has to blame himself because of his behavior over the last few years and just this ridiculousness of defending, you know, Mount defending Surabachi the person who he has access all, to, defending yes. the person he has access to. That's what it is. That's what it is. It's dishonest and it's been wrong. And Tony's problems are his own fault, but it's also the fault of the people that he's been listening to who won't just tell him that he's not good at this. Those are the ratings. This was the drive through Any closing words? Yes. I would like to have a lot of money to work very little and spend almost all of my time at home with my family. Wait a minute. I already do. I didn't even have to take a job with Tony. That's right. You have the Tony Khan plan, but without the uh, benefits of... Uh, without the Tony Khan. Without the Tony Khan.